All right, everyone, this is Norval Central coming back at you with another YouTube video, and I'm actually joined by Drake. Uh, he's going to introduce himself and uh, get let him get to know you a little bit more. What's up, guys? Uh, my name is Drake. I'm one of the three hosts over at the Locked On Number for Locked On Seminoles. It's me, uh, my friend, my best friend, Max, my best friend, Dave. Uh, you can follow all of us, me at Tally underscore underscore Drake. You can follow Max at MaxMovie17. You can follow Dave at FSU Knowles. I think it's like a zero is the Knoll and the five is the S at yeah. the end. He's kind of old, man, so I don't He's a little bit of a boomer when it comes to that. But, uh, yeah, well, I mean, folks, you know, we try to do the fan-centric perspective. We're fans first, people second, podcasters third. And we try to give the – try to educate, you know, each and every one of y'all about FSU football overall. So, Yeah, and I know y'all have a YouTube channel. Um, are y'all close to 1,000 subscribers or have y'all already passed We that We just finally hit 1,000 subscribers, which is really funny because yeah. I remember we, we had this, like, push to 1,000 that Max kept talking about. And we uh – -huh. We're, we're we're surprised that we hit that because like it's, it's it's really weird that we started this idea off as uh, we were Knowles Anonymous before and then joined Locked On and overall like damn we actually went from like having ten people listen to us to a thousand people subscribe to us for our opinions and it's uh it's pretty damn cool I ain't gonna lie. Gotcha. How long have y'all been doing it so far? Uh, we started. I want to say it was Norvell's sec. I think it was Norvell's first year. I think it was uh -huh. 20, 2019? No, yeah. twenty twenty. Sorry, we started in twenty twenty. And then overall, like that's what we started right before the uh, the Jeff Sims game where he uh, yeah. with Marvin Wills, Tom and Terry, all that entire type of thing. And that's oh, so we've been that's... about for almost two years now. Yeah, I think I called on to y'all probably about February of 2021. That was when mm -hmm. I kind of saw everything kind of go viral with that. Because like I said, any kind of seminal out, uh, outlet out there, I just try to get as much information as I can, get a lot of feedback. And that's kind of what I wanted to bring you on and just try to get different feedbacks from different people because everybody has a certain opinion. There may be some bright side knolls. There may be some dark side knolls. Some people may be in between. Oh, Lord. You're gonna, are, you, are you really going to start with that, man, right now? I'm joking. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really funny. Guys. That's why I think our show is really good because I don't think any three of us agree on it. Like, we agree on a lot of things, but we are very opinionated. And I think yeah. that also with our friends that we've had, like, I've known Max for about 10 years. I've known Dave mm -hmm. for about eight. And overall, like, we bring a sort of different perspective for each of us, too. And ironically, also, you know, Max is a lobbyist. Well, now he's a consultant. Um, Dave and I are attorneys, too, so we can kind of bring that kind of sort of extra flavor to the show. And that's we all have our opinions, and like, honestly, we back them up really well. So that's basically what we try to do every, each and every single day. Oh, yeah, man. Well, I'm going to first start out by talking about some of the season this past year. Uh, Florida State started out as an 0-4 start, and then they ended up winning five of their last eight games. What were kind of your thought process throughout the season? I know it's a roller coaster of emotions going on. Yeah, um, so – it was really funny because, like, I think Max and I were a little more bullish on FSU playing Notre Dame closer in the first game, which eventually that we did. And then we we usually have someone come on for our Know Your Foe segment, which is basically mm -hmm. we have a reporter or a personality from the other side's team come on the week before for, like, hey, you were playing this and such team, so to educate our fan base. For Jacksonville State, we had someone on the year before, like one of uh, Max's friends, Moose Lewis, who's a coach mm -hmm. over at Gobby. But that year we're like, no, we're fine. We're good. We don't need to bring anybody on to Jacksonville State. And then that happened. And then my entire opinion about the entire, I guess, coaching staff, I had changed immediately uh, yeah. with Coach Adam Fuller. I'm like, I need this man fired. I need someone yeah. fired. Just to, yeah. It needs to feel something. But it was where the 0-4 start was like a lot of it just led me to believe that Norvell might not be the guy at all whatsoever. I yeah. mean, I wasn't super high on the hire to begin with, but I started coming around a little bit to him more with like his recruiting prowess. But then when you see the five wins in the last eight games, mm -hmm. it does show you that Maybe this like it's a really slow, slow climb. It might not be as fast as a lot of people want it to be, yeah. but we're start. We but now I think we're at the point that that was really great and all. But now I need to see you, you know, have the proper coaching decisions. Like why was Mackenzie Mellon playing four games? Why was you know some of these these uh these uh that the Clemson game too? Like the play calling to me was a little bit suspect. The George yeah. uh the Florida game was one of those like it's like if JT was out there for the full game. In my personal opinion, we'd have won that game too. We've been six and six. So like to me at this point now it's like. I think this is the year that I know Taggart had, you know, do something as a tagline. Now, for me, Norvell in 2022 is you need to show me something. Yeah, it was definitely something because, you know, I'm a season ticket holder at Florida State. And, you know, going to the Jacksonville State game, you, you saw Zarek Cooper's uh, – actually, his parents were sitting two rows ahead of me. Oh, really? Was, yeah, the whole visitor section was there. They were planting the flag right there. Um, it was something different to see. And, man, it was a, it was a hard car ride home. So it was definitely something. <laughs> See, what more made me mad about that game, it wasn't even that we lost. It was the explanation of why the hell we weren't playing that prevent defense at the end of the yeah. game. Was, and then where, where he was like, it's like, oh, you know, we kept a timeout because they might do a field mm -hmm. goal. And I'm sitting there, I'm just like, 
I mean, he's got to throw like 60 yards. Just, just why yeah. are you playing to do that? Just like, if it's a tie game, your FSU should be able to yeah. beat them in OT. Like I'm like, I'm even at worst case scenario. And I'm just like, come on, man, you gotta be better than that. Cause you're a pretty good coach beat coach. Like you gotta yeah. be better than that. Yeah. There was a lot of different things. Uh, kind of like you touched on it before with the McKenzie Milton playing four games, kind of going through that whole process. And I understand, you know, it's a high coming off the Notre Dame game where he went like five for seven for like 48 yards in that Notre Dame game at the end. You know, they all thought it was going to be McKenzie Milton of old, and it just didn't pan out that way, you know. And Jordan Travis yeah. didn't do any favors with some of his durability issues, and it just kind of kind of snowballed. And I hate to see it. I mean, that's – I think the staff was pretty much prepared for the end of the season, but to come in and, and have that easy part of the schedule at the beginning of the season, and you thought the end of the half of the season was going to be kind of rough for him, and it turned out to be one of their most successful runs there at the end, so – yeah, I mean, they did play tougher. I mean, the one thing I would probably would say is that, like Malik, Cun- I think no one could see Malik Cunningham taking the next step forward. Yeah. That we kind of saw him do that. Like to me, I think Malik Cunningham is the best quarterback in the conference overall. And mm-hmm. then Sam Hartman. I mean, we we got boat raced by Wake Forest, but then also you have to take into account that Mackenzie Milton, I think, turned the ball over five times total. Yeah. And I mean, my co-host Max was on the was of the belief that Mackenzie Milton shouldn't have started the period in going into going into I think even yeah. fall camp primarily because. It t- it's very telling. I think he said this. I think James Coleman has said it as well. That's mm-hmm. very telling where you would never give up your starting job to your best friend. Like, I wouldn't give my job to one of my closest friends. I love what I do in my attorney. I would never do that if I don't think I'm better than my friend at all at that period. Mm-hmm. So, and then we saw that he didn't have the same zip in his, in, in his, yeah. in his football. He didn't have the same sort of, you know, movement in the pocket too because the knee injury. The Notre Dame thing was, it was dope. But one of the things I said was that it's basically – he could be like another Alex Smith where he had a catastrophic leg injury, almost lost it, and then just be, you know, a sh- basically a shell of his former self, which really, really sucks. But overall, he just wasn't able to perform at a power five level. And with Jordan Travis, the durability issues, it's Jordan to me is a very average quarterback when it comes to passing yeah. the ball. But he's a, he is probably a top five dynamic athlete when it comes to running the ball with his legs. There's He's just super fun to watch. We call him a gamer on the show every single day. But – my problem is the durability issues and we just yeah. don't know if like if you, it, it's really hard to depend on someone like that when they're not available every single damn day or even you know it's, it, it's just worrying you know yeah i was just kind of concerned because i actually talked about this and touched on this in another previous episode um basically just talking about jordan travis is basically a tick below average passer um his progressions going through some of his progressions were not the greatest in the world. He really showcased his ability in the last three games of the season against Boston College, Miami, and also Florida. But just overall, I mean, he is – what makes him so great is just the utilization of his legs. Uh, you saw that during the spring game, and he wasn't able to be able to use those legs, and you Agreed. saw what happened. Um, and I, I do think that he is a top seven quarterback in the ACC, but there is so much talent in the ACC just in terms of quarterback production, like Sam Hartman, Malik Cunningham, you know, Brendan Armstrong is another guy. I, I don't even want to say Tyler Van Dyke, but you know, see, yeah, Ty, see, that's where, like, see, I say that Jordan Travis is probably your ninth best QB in the court in the uh, uh-huh. conference, primarily because yeah. the the top level of the entire ACC, like, I because I'm unlocked on the ACC, so I watch mm-hmm. the other quarterbacks each and every single day to prepare for that show. Mm-hmm. Like, to me, it's just we probably have top to bottom overall the best quarterbacks in the entire yeah. country. If we're I being agree. completely honest here, like, I know SEC, the SEC has Max Johnson, they also have yeah. Bryce Young. Spencer Rattler too now, but once you go, but even our, you know, mid tier players are still extremely good. Phil Jerkovic is good. Yeah. Brandon Armstrong, who quite frankly could push to be a top, top QB actually in the next NFL draft. You also have Tyler Van Dyke, who I thought was going to be nothing. And then you saw him turn it on from the second half of our game on yeah. that kid is definitely, he has the, the way the ball leaves his hand. It just jumps out. And mm-hmm. overall the quarterbacks overall in this conference are just so damn good. And to me with, my issue primarily with Jordan is not the progression so much because I will say the offensive line doesn't give him enough time at yeah. times, even though towards the end of the year, I did think they performed better. And mm-hmm. the wide receivers, I mean, we, I think every single podcast has discussed how the wide receivers basically have struggled with separation or speed or even catching the ball. But I think to more, it's more that he he tends to panic and have the happy feet sort of thing. I see the same thing when I played baseball with a few friends of mine too as well when we're growing up. And, mm-hmm. and to me overall, it's just it's – I just think that he – it's so far gone now that it's, I think, four years down now that he's been playing quarterback at the college level. Yeah. It's I think he's, the details that he needs to fix, the mechanics he needs to fix, are so small and minute that they're habitual at this point. And I don't know if he's going to be able to do that with the staff or have enough time. 
Yeah, I, I just don't know, you know, and a lot of people keep critiquing on the certain things of the staff bringing in another quarterback, and that's great and all to bring in because you have three scholarship quarterbacks on the roster and Rodemaker, Duffy, and also Travis. But when you look at the options at the quarterback market in general, there wasn't really much to really hang your hat on. I mean, if if you really looked at certain quarterbacks in the transfer portal as it is, it was kind of just saying, hey, here's a guy that we can come out here and make a number basically at this point. And that's really all you were really doing. I'm not necessarily condoning um, Rodemaker to be the second string quarterback because I don't know if he's quite ready to make that jump just yet. You know, some guys take four, you know, even three years down the road. He's a three-year starter now at this point and trying to figure out everything that's going on. And you can't really expect A.J. Duffy as a true freshman to really hang his hat on and, and be that guy just yet. But, man, it's uh, it's going to be tough if, if Florida State does kind of have a Jordan Travis situation where he does go down, what happens then? I mean, it makes you long for the day of Sean McGuire being the backup, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I miss Max. But, no, I mean, you're – you're, I, I do agree with you to an extent where that yeah. the options that the options that were out there, I guess there were there, but like it's it's more that would they consider coming to FSU? Exactly. Like to me, in my personal opinion, outside Caleb Williams, the best QB was Jackson Dart. There's no way in hell you're gonna get Jackson Dart to come over here. No. So to me, the kids that you probably should have targeted were I think Casey Thompson would have had interest to play yeah. here. I think that me personally, I think the best QB option would have been Jane Deloria, the former Washington State quarterback who transferred over to Arizona. Similar skill set, similar size. I think he has a little bit of a stronger arm, but also someone that if Jordan Travis does eventually go down, that you will be feel confident putting him in the game because I know Tate Rodemaker, you know, did really well in spring. And he quite honestly, he might be like Jacob Coker, where he needs four years to develop and then you feel yeah. comfortable going to a game. But I've seen him play numerous times under live action and under the lights, and he just shrinks and shrivels. And it's, it's just, it's, he doesn't have like, it is, it is sad to see that because I'm like, he has the confidence to do that, but it just it seems, it seems like something doesn't click when the game starts. And A.J. Duffy, I know a lot of people are afraid to start him. I'm in the belief that he'll play at least four games this year, maybe even start yeah. those four games because yeah. of either injury. But to me, it's like you got to be careful with that because I Dave says this all the time on the show that we don't want another James Blackman scenario where your confidence is shattered at a, such a young age that it doesn't matter how much talent in the world you have when you don't have the confidence with it. Look at David Carr with the Texans. Yep. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about that, and you know, if you bring in A.J. Duffy against Duquesne and then you also bring him against Louisiana Lafayette, there's two games right there that you can legitimately say that he's going to have some experience, meaningful reps at that point. Yep. Now you're trying to find those other two if if Travis does go down or, you know, if they're up in a game or something like that. But it's just very hard to see with Tate Rodemaker with some of his decision-making during live game action. You're trying to figure out the best possible scenario for him. You've seen reports throughout camp where he was really showcasing his talent at times. And then times he was just kind of – you didn't even know he was there in practice. So that's the next step he's got to take in, in terms of being a better quarterback and in terms of where he's going to be with his future at Florida State. I mean, yeah. I mean, to me, Jay, I mean, Tate Rodemaker is someone that I don't think is going to go anywhere. I think he's yeah. someone that is in there for the long haul. I think he really does believe in Mike Norvell and his system. I mean, it's just – it goes to – I mean, this kind of points more towards the – I guess the management of the quarterback room, which hasn't been, I guess, the greatest – I mean, there have been, you know, rumblings and rumors about the entire Chubb Curry situation, why he actually eventually, you know, dipped out. And then you see basically, I mean, the only quarterbacks that Mike has to show for, you know, are signing here as they're still on the roster are A.J. Duffy and also uh, Tate Rodemaker too. And, I mean, you saw what happened with Luke Altmaier. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Luke Altmaier, you know, maybe if Jackson Dart, you know, has this sort of, you know, fall camp that he has, Luke Altmaier be, might be someone that might be looking at his options somewhere else because I would do the same thing too because Luke Altmaier is pretty damn good. But overall, like it's, I mean, with Tate, uh, he's just someone that I don't know. I just really, really don't know what to put it at at this point. Yeah, and you have to also think too. I mean, Jordan Travis just graduated at Fort yeah. State, so you wonder if this is possibly his last year. I mean, that could also be a scenario where he's coming into a situation where Florida State's going into next season with Chris Parson, AJ Duffy, and Tate Rodemaker, and. That's kind of the question where you may bring in an experience option to kind of counteract some of those things. But who do you have at that point? Who would you actually go for? And if Florida State doesn't succeed, in my opinion, because I, I do think that this roster is about a six or a seven win team right now, just in terms of skill set, they could overachieve possibly. But I'm just saying baseline that that's where they need to be at at least to um, kind of keep everything intact in, in terms of recruiting efforts and everything like that. But uh, we'll kind of get into that a little bit later about uh, next season. But 
just overall, man, it's a lot of question marks with that quarterback room going forward. And it hasn't felt like that since basically when Frenchie <laughs> went down 2017. Like we've always talked yeah. about basically how the offensive line was that wasn't a question mark. We just knew like, are they gonna be able to block? And the answer would have been no, 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 until Ox Atkins got here. And now the yeah. quarterback room is just it's just it been sort of I guess chaos is kind of a good way to put it. Well, you know, the way Frenchie leaving out, James Blockman not panning out, and then now we have Dojo and Travis, Alex Hornybrook, Mackenzie Mill, and just all these sort of things where it's like it's been really hard to find something else. And if Jordan Travis, <clears throat> sorry, if Jordan Travis was fully healthy for an entire season, we wouldn't be having this discussion, right? Because Jordan Travis, like it, that's I think primarily our major concern. And I think it's more that points to the coaches that were like, hey, you weren't able to find any single person you were comfortable with bringing in here to not be a backup because I think it's really hard to ask for someone transferring from a school. To be like, hey, are you okay with being in the second option? Because I know you were that the same thing over there. So mm-hmm. how won't you be over here? Yeah. I think it's just it's difficult to find someone to be, or sorry, it was it was it was a bit difficult to ask of the staff for that. But I don't think it was difficult to ask the staff to find someone to actually compete for the spot, especially when there were a few options out there that kind of fit similar skill skill set. Yeah, yeah, I was just kind of concerned about that, but. Man, there's, there's just a lot of question marks on the team so far coming into the season because you're trying to find those proven options. And another option that I've kind of looked through with the position groups is with Jermaine Johnson and Keir Thomas leaving out. You know, you're getting two quality pass rushers that are leaving for an un, you know undrafted free agent deal and then also with Jermaine Johnson going down there in the first round. But it just, you know, you brought in Jared Verse with a productive pass rusher. You got Derek McClendon that's having some good flashes with certain things, but you're trying to find some more options. Maybe that's a Patrick Payton. You know, maybe it's a Byron Turner if he's healthy. There's just a lot of different question marks and Quayshon Fuller transferring out and going elsewhere. That hurt. That hurt. I'm not going to lie to you. (laughs) You know, and the, the whole, the whole thing with that situation, I'm not really sure what happened in that whole situation, but hopefully Quayshon finds a, a good home and everything and we'll definitely be cheering for him throughout the process. But man, it's just a, it's just a tough pill to swallow. What what are some of your thoughts on that that whole situation? So I think I'm a little more bullish on the defensive line than most folks because I think the interior has a chance to be probably tops in the conference. Um aside from you know Clemson and maybe Miami I, Miami does have Leonard Taylor over there along the defensive front, but I don't know. But And they bring in the other transfer, I think, West Virginia. But I think that we'll be competing with those two for a top three spot yeah. because I do love Fabian Lovett. The kid's getting drafted. Yeah. Robert Cooper, the same damn thing. They do what a defense tackle is supposed to do at an elite level. And then what Dennis Briggs is someone they can bring on the mm-hmm. inside, bring on the outside. I think Dennis Briggs, honestly, in my personal opinion, will exceed what Keir Thomas did last year in doing both yeah. those sort of things. Uh, with Jared Verse. I don't. I didn't think he was going to start start the year. I think he was going to probably be acclimated at game speed, and then probably by game three or game four, he will be plugged in the starter. Now, probably they feel that Jared Verse is ready for the big time, ready for the speed. You know, with the departure of Quayshawn Fuller, and then you mentioned Patrick Payton, who gained some good weight. George Wilson too, as well. Byron Turner too. Like we he, actually he have options good. along there. You yeah. know, they look great. Like that <laughs> defensive line actually looks like for the first time in a very long time to be a power five collegiate level like conference offensive line. So it's like that's our defensive line. So to yeah. me, like that's – I am actually really so, so to see the defensive linemen. Linebackers, we'll see how that turns out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was very skeptical on uh, Jarrett Jackson, and he's a guy I've really kind of paying my head on later in the season because I didn't think he had much effort. I thought the energy wasn't there. He was kind of out of shape at certain times, and now this offseason, man, he is really yeah, he progressing look, well. He looks good too. Like he looks locked in. <laughs> and I'm surprised. I mean – a lot of times last season when – or actually the 2020 season, we weren't really produ- uh, producing sack-wise. I think uh, I think it was Robinson who had three sacks as our only mm-hmm. defensive end to record a sack. And, you know, everybody was calling for Odell's job and different things like that. And then you see the progress- production from, you know, Robert Cooper and Baby and Love It, and it's just a whole different kind of story with that whole situation. So it's exciting to see. And yeah, I think it's also like to me, I think one of the things that people don't talk about with Jermaine Johnson's fall in the draft is like you, they, you can, I think coaching staffs or GMs in the National Football League were able to point to he was able to do that sort of that sort of production mm-hmm. because of the two kids in the front right there. And to me, that's something that we have a we have a segment that Max are called Unsung Heroes and Fabian oh. Lovett and Robert Cooper were on there numerous, numerous times for what the little things that they do, because they, they do the little things perfect along the trenches. And to mm-hmm. me, like Fabian Lovett and Robert Cooper. They're going to lead that defense um, along the front. So overall, like to me, they 
they do a great job. And we forgot about Malcolm Ray too, who was someone yeah, that guy, was yeah. sort of taken as a flyer back, I think in Taggart's, I think first full on class. And that's yeah. someone that he looks the part and he's just, he's playing really well. And like, to me, to keep the first two fresh, it's, you, you need solid depth. And I think that's what we have with Jackson, as you mentioned before, Malcolm Ray. And also probably the next probably big one that we haven't discussed yet is Joshua Farmer. Yep. And that's, that's a big transition for him, especially playing defensive end in high school and then transforming over to the defensive tackle spot. He actually informed me that he was about 310 now, I believe. So that's really big for him just in terms of weight standpoint. Now, he's got to piece it together, of course, but mm -hmm. just something that he's got to work on and, and build to kind of piece off that weight that he has. So, But, man, it's just uh, – it's something. I know you mentioned about the linebackers. We'll kind of go over that position group real quick. And I'm kind of bullish on the linebackers. Uh, not really the depth of the position, just more along the lines of just Kevin Deloach and also Tatum Bethune. I mean, those guys – with Tatum Bethune coming out of UCF, and he had those 108 total tackles. And then Kalen Deloach last season had about 74 total tackles. So he was definitely a bright spot for the Knowles last season. And you're bringing in a guy like Omar Graham Jr. I know the recruiting effort of the linebacker position has not been the greatest in the world. Um, they definitely <laughs> found a great gym in Omar Graham Jr. Um, but past that, you know, it's – they were lucky to bring in Tatum Bethune because that was definitely a needed piece for that because – you were really going to have to debate and really bring on Stephen Dix Jr. and DJ Lundy and Amari Gaynor. Those guys have not really developed properly. And when asked to do a whole lot, especially coming up in run support and also in coverage, they haven't really been the greatest. You're even trying to stick a defense back in Brendan Gant that you tried to switch over to a linebacker. And I don't know. I think you're just sticking something to the wall and seeing if it sticks. I just – no, I mean, that's fair. And we they tried yeah. the same experiment with uh, Judeus Green McKnight, and we yep. now see that he's actually transferred mm -hmm. over to Marshall. Best of luck to him in all his future endeavors. Yeah. I think he also joined Kalen LeBourne over there, too. Yep. But to me, Tatum Bethune, I think, is going to be a really special player, primarily. My brother, he actually is a UCF alum. He's a UCF booster, and he was very sad to see him go. And that's someone that I think had, what, 101 total tackles, I think about 12, 10 sacks, something along those lines. And I'm like, you got that from your damn linebacker. That's that's yeah. utterly insane. I don't care what conference you're playing in. And then with Caden Deloach, Caden Deloach to me is someone that I'm surprised it took him this long to break out. We heard all the reports, yeah. not last year, but the year before, that he was just a stud in camp. Stud in spring, stud in fall camp, stud in summer. Mm -hmm. And then just out of nowhere, they didn't play him. And then we see that now, like, coverage-wise, he's your best linebacker. At run fits, he's your best linebacker. And motor-wise, you see the, uh, the safety against Boston College. Yeah, there's not like that kid when he locks onto you, he diagnoses it like that, and you're done, you're out. Like that's something that you want from your linebackers. And you speak to the depth. I think Brandon Gaines is better at linebacker because I don't think he's that yeah. great in coverage. I think he's also if you tell him to go to one direction, that man, <laughs> you, you're he's good. You're done. He's gonna he's gonna put the yeah. boomstick down and basically you know tackle for a loss me one two yards. But if you ask him to be in space, being safety, I don't think it's quick enough for that. And then with DJ Lundy, I've always said that. I think maybe like 20 years ago, Max has said this also too. Like this yeah. is basically I get my idea from him that he was a if in the 90s he'd be a all ACC all American linebacker. You can't be like that anymore in, this, in today's college football. And then with Omar Graham, I'm high on him too. But I it's I want to get to the point that we don't start freshmen like you know mm -hmm. day one on defense because that I mean it's great for the development, but also like it might stretch them too thin. So I just don't you know that's with me kind of how I stand with Omar Graham, Stephen Dix Jr. He's a de decent death piece. I mean, he's someone that, you know, will spell you yeah. out. And so. I just wish that, um, you know, when we recruited Stephen Dix Jr. out of high school, you know, he only played like two years of football. So it was just more of a developmental project anyway. You know, mm -hmm. of course, he was a four-star prospect. A lot of people get caught up in stars sometimes. And Omar Graham Jr. probably should have been a low four-star, but with his production in high school. But, of course, that didn't, that didn't come to fruition. So, you're still trying to figure out different pieces in that linebacker room. And with DJ Lundy, I know you talked about how he could be a prototypical 1990s linebacker. Um, he did decrease his weight, so I think he's down to 235 now, I believe. He yeah, I did see good, that. But it's just, you know, it's – We'll see. We'll see. Problem. We'll see with Rand. I mean, one thing – I mean, Chris Marvel, you said before, like he wasn't the great at recruiting, but yeah. he did showcase like a, a talent, a knack to develop, like a DJ yeah. Lundy, Stephen Jr., because mm – -hmm. I think Raymond Woody was the opposite. Raymond Woody was a great recruiter for, yeah. for, for that spot, but he was not mm -hmm. a good developer of talent at all whatsoever. And then Randy Shane, I think Randy Shane's like bread and butter was linebackers. Yep. And that to me, someone actually have a lot of faith in what that's what I mean. That's what we got to Bethune and then yep. Omar Graham. And to me, I know Omar Graham was a higher three-star, 
listen, I'm going to take a linebacker from South Florida each and every single day. I'm from down here, and basically we're built different. That's all it is. Yeah, I'm just really excited. Um, I wasn't super thrilled with the Randy Shannon to co DC, but I, I do like him as a linebacker. Neither coach. is Max. <laughs> Neither yeah, is my coach. I, trust me. He calls it a lazy man, hire. <laughs> I get it because I understand that both Adam Fuller and Randy Shannon work well together. I understand that completely. But the problem with me was I really didn't see the the need to put him as co DC. I mean, he's still gonna have, you know, that, but I mean, why would you elevate him to a new title like that instead of just elevating him to linebackers coach, let him kind of develop in that kind of role and system and then be able to move him up eventually down the road. I know he probably won't ever be a head coach again because we saw how that went with Miami and other stops that he's had as well. But just overall, I mean, I was very confused with that. I understand wanting to keep the staff together. And and we've talked about this in previous podcasts as well, that, you know, Tony Tokarts is going to quarterbacks coach. Alex Atkins is being promoted to offensive coordinator. They're keeping most of the core guys there, but just overall, I, I was very confused by that role, and I don't think he's not going to succeed in that role. I just think it's kind of odd placement, odd timing to do that just yet, and I think it was a little bit too early. I mean, it's no one likes an internal hire when the program or what you're doing is not performing yeah. well. It's yeah. really hard to defend, and like I've, the, I mean, I like the ranch and the co DC hire. Mm-hmm. I personally, honestly, like it's just known fact that I'm not the biggest Adam Fuller fan yeah. personally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I do agree, like Max is, you know, say at length that Rain Shane was brought in for recruiting. What mm-hmm. linebackers are we in there for right now? And also for defensive, like the co DC for Adam Fuller, why won't you just fire him if you're going to demote him, basically, and give him the yeah. split sort of role with that? And then with Tony Tokars, that's another thing where it's like you couldn't go out and grab somebody a little bit better when it comes to, you know, QB development. Yeah. I know that, I, I know the thing that's discussed at nauseum is that his rapport with Jordan Travis is a big thing. Mm-hmm. But we also need to understand that Jordan Travis might not be here for much longer. I said for, for he gra- he graduated this past spring, and then with Alex Atkins, to me, he's the only one that makes sense to me because I think he's what he's done with the yeah. offensive line is nothing short of a miracle. <laughs> if yeah. we're being completely honest here, and also to me, Alex Atkins is going to be a head coach somewhere someday. I think that he has that mentality when it comes to coaching. He loves what he does, and also that he's a damn good recruiter. To me, Alex Atkins is the best coach on staff overall. So. Yeah. I definitely agree with you on that front because, like I said, I think you keep out Atkins as long as you can. I don't really think he wants to have that that group of five deal just yet. I think he wants to get more of a power five deal. But Florida State's got to produce on the field before they really see some of those eyeballs with, with some of the power five schools there. So I think he's probably going to stay around two to three more years, possibly. That's probably what you're going to get him locked up as as an offense coordinator. Yeah. He loves to grow and develop under Mike Norvell. He's always talked about that before with previous relationships that he's had with him. So it's very exciting to see that Florida State really hit the nail on the coffin with him. And, you know, even a guy like Marcus Woodson, I think he's done a pretty good job for the most part. I know that Travis Hunter blunder uh, at the end of National Signing Day right there was not the best in the world to deal with. But you also got Sam McCall to add to the roster, Azaria Thomas as well. Mm-hmm. So, and even a greedy Vance that you added. So there's a lot of, yeah, that's low key, a really good signing too. greedy yeah. Vance. I've, I've, I've come around on that actually. And Jarquez McClellan from the transfer yeah. class last year too. I was very surprised because I really wasn't super high on greedy Vance because I thought more along the lines of looking at some of his PFF grades, looking at his tape, he was very good in man coverage, but when it comes to zone, my gosh, you better watch out because it was something. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Let's go ahead and go to the 2022 season and what you expect from, you know, the season as a whole. Because, like I said, Florida State went 5-7 and seven last season, and we're trying to find our footing in coming into this year. I don't really think it's pivotal for Mike Norvell to, to really um, win eight or nine games like some people are saying, but I do think you need to have some kind of bowl eligibility to obtain that level of success and have something to sell recruits because – at the end of the day, if you don't win six or seven games and you win five games next season, that's a very, very bad look in terms of just trying to build a culture and a foundation. Yeah, it's tough. And, like, one thing that we say, we do a monthly, basically, like, check-in to see where we're at. We go through the schedule, see where do we see wins here, here, yeah. and here. Because you, you see with rosters ever so – if super in flux, you see transfers coming in and out too as well. Like, to me, I say that we can win eight. We should win seven and we will win six. To me, like the thing, the, yeah. the minimum you have to meet is that bowl eligibility mark of six wins. Yeah. Because a schedule, a schedule isn't easy by any chance, but it's not the most the most difficult schedule in the world. I mean, you have Georgia Tech, 
who is going to be god awful this year, losing a lot of players, including <laughs> yeah. Jameer Gibbs. Jeff Collins might not even coach that game. Uh, you play yeah. Syracuse. <laughs> you play Louisiana yeah. Lafayette. You play Duquesne. That's four. That's four. So there's right two there. games out there you should that you also should grab. LSU yeah. being an early game, you should be competitive. I'm of the belief that you get the worst version of a good team at the first game. That's why I was so bullish. I was covering against Notre Dame. And then also another one, Boston College, you have that's in Doak. Yeah. NC State has lost a lot of players, even though Devin Leary, I think, is up there as great as a good yeah. QB, but that's something that you can take away. But to me, overall, and you look at the rivalry games, I love Tyler Van Dyke. I think Tyler Van Dyke is a damn good QB. Who is throwing the ball to? Yeah. Because Charleston Rambo is gone. Trust me, I got I got friends down here in my fans too. They know they love Xavier Restrepo. We they just don't know yeah. if he's a wide receiver one yet. So six to me is very, very attainable. If you hit a five, we say this all the time on there. If Mike Nevelle's on the hot seat, I don't we don't think that he's on the hot seat, but if he doesn't hit expectations for 2022, 2023 might be a lame duck season. Yep, for that's that's how I also agree to it as well. And I mean, you even talked about uh some of the games that we have on the slate for this season. And I even think about that Louisville game. We have struggled to beat Louisville the last couple of years, and we're getting them on a bye week after LSU, and you're going straight into that Friday night road game when Louisville actually has to play during that bye week that we're off. And so, they play UCF, yeah, which is a hard team to play anyways. Exactly. And that's that's the thing that a lot of Florida State fans don't really realize is, like, we haven't beat Louisville in a while. And they are a very good team with Malik Cunningham kind of orchestrating that offense. And, man, it's just it, – it's a favorable schedule. I mean, I, I could see, like you said, six, seven, eight wins. Um, and that's that's the expectation for right now. I'm not setting a low bar just because of that. I mean – the terms of just this team's production, I mean, we could easily have been six and six or seven and five last season. A couple of things didn't go our way, of course. We had Jordan Travis got the flu during NC State. I mean, that stuff like that happens. And you have to figure out a way to battle through adversity. Mike Norville has said this in many press conferences. What will they do when the bright lights are on? And that's the thing we're trying to figure out this season. We have a gauntlet there with Louisville, Boston College. I mean, Wait for us. We have it all right there. <laughs> it's low key kind of tough. Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, and then like that's where like the thing that six and seven is such a good mark to point to yeah. because I think that's basically realistically that's where you should be. Yeah. And honestly, if you win seven games, you can Mike Norvell. As much as you know, I've been you know like looking at his resume. You look at it like you've increased by two wins every single season. You went from three yeah. and six, five and seven, you go seven and five. I'm like, I can't argue that you actually this climb that you've been you know been preaching yeah. for the past few years. Mm-hmm. I can actually see it in real time. And that's more yeah. mainly what I think most fans want to see. We need to see yeah. this proof of concept actually be applied and like actually lead to some wins. Cause we, not only do we care, the recruits kind of care too, because right <laughs> now Florida is also struggling with Billy Napier. I mean, they have they yeah. fire Mullen for that. Miami just finally is committed now to football, you know, depending on how you want to see their commitment is overall yeah. with them with John Ruiz over there, you know, basically running the show. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll see how it goes, but to me, like the six and seven mark, that's where you need to end up at the end of the day. Yeah, and I'm very excited to see how this team kind of performs because, you know, we have a lot of players that are coming in. We have a couple of summer enrollees, and I believe we're at 80 scholarship players right now, so we have to get – you know, we may sign about five more. So if you're looking at some of those JUCO guys maybe and some of the offensive tackles and offensive linemen that we're bringing in, and it's just going to be really exciting to see how Florida State kind of comprises their team together, and hopefully we're able to to get those six or seven wins or maybe even overachieve and get eight or nine. I mean – like I said, uh, Mike Norville, I know his expectations are very high on this team. He expects a lot from this team. We all understand the standard at Florida State because it is so high, set by Bobby Bowden, Jimbo Fisher. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've really kind of fell down the deep end the last five years. Um, but hopefully we're able to kind of get back on the right track. And I think this is a good year to do it. I think Max said it best. I think that the previous performances over the past few years should not change what you should. This should the standard should be here. You shouldn't just because we have been bad does not mean that you should be okay with being a bad team or a bad program. I think at the end of the day, that's kind of what we have to ask yourself with that. Expectations can change, but the standard will always remain the same here. The standard here is competing for the conference and competing for a national title each and every single few years. Like that's where we should all meet up at the end of the day. Yeah, man. Well, Drake, it was fantastic to have you on today and kind of talk a couple of different thoughts and everything. Love seeing other people's feedback and everything. Like I said, whether whether we believe in the same things or not, you know, we're all Florida State fans trying to see Florida State great again. So uh, hopefully we won't be like Miami where we say we're back every single season. But, you know, we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> yeah, we're not we're not we're not celebrating, you know, being offseason champs every single damn year. Yeah. How they have been since what, 20, 2001? Like when's the yeah. last time any of these recruits saw Miami win anything? 
if we're being honest here, I think what like they're like, they're 18 now. So yeah. that would be what 2005. Yeah. So basically, they they so the entire freshman class going into Miami now has never seen them compete. I guess actually win a conference title. Yeah, if you ever, if you think of it that way. Yeah, it's it's crazy to think about. And, but you know, we're we're gonna take it day by day. Keep climbing yeah. every single day. Um, we're gonna enjoy Florida State football and Florida State athletics throughout the time here. But like I said, I really do appreciate you coming on today. And I uh, hope everybody checks out all their social media platforms and hopefully you go check them out. Cause like I said, they do a lot of great stuff over there. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you can shoot me a message, shoot Drake a message as well. And we'll definitely be able to answer your questions. But as always, we hope everybody enjoys the rest of the video and go Knowles. Take care, everybody.